Hi, welcome to the forever crypto war and forever figure out how to reset up the thing that you just set up five minutes ago. Um, it's great to be here. This is a wonderful place to have a good panel. And my panel consists of, going down, Rihanna Pfefferkorn, who is the Associate Directory of Cy Surveillance and Cybersecurity at the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School. Next down, we have Matt Blaze, who is veteran of two crypto wars and professor at Georgetown. Um, actually, that was two down. <laughs> In the middle, Daniel J. Weitzner is founding director of the MIT Internet Policy Research Initiative, principal research scientist at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Previously, he was United States Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Internet Policy in the White House, a founder of the Center for Democracy and Technology, led the W3C public policy activities, and was the Deputy Policy Director of the EFF. And me, I'm John Callis. I am Senior Technology Fellow at the ACLU. I'm also a veteran of two crypto wars and co-founder of several crypto-oriented startups. So we're going to start off with short presentations from all of us, and then we're going to talk among ourselves, and then we're going to open it up. And we're going to start with Rihanna. Great. Thanks, everybody, for coming like this early in the morning. Like First session, first day is like a tough sledding here. I want to start what sounds like maybe kind of an extraneous overview, given that you guys are all veterans, apparently, of the crypto wars, uh, of current encryption law in the US. We're going to get into talking about international law over this panel, too. I think Danny's going to talk to us about that. But if United States law were not the way that it is, if it did not presently afford US companies the freedom around encryption that it does, we wouldn't be having this debate because we wouldn't have the iPhone and WhatsApp and Signal, et cetera, that we have today. So currently, strong encryption, by which I mean encryption that has not been uh, undermined at the behest of any government, is legal in the United States, at least for now. Uh, as you probably know, it wasn't always the case. Uh, encryption was regulated as a munition, like a bomb, up until the late 90s. It was subject to certain export controls. It's still regulated, but now under the Commerce Department. And so things are a bit more chill than they used to be. But the idea of export-grade crypto was that Americans should have good security, and the NSA should be able to pwn everybody else. So we saw stuff like 40-bit session keys, which now it takes like a decoder ring out of a Cracker Jack box to be able to crack. And we have seen, you know, years and years later, you can attribute the freak logjam and drone attacks from 2015 and 2016 to export grade crypto. So it turned out that this was maybe kind of a nearsighted policy approach on behalf of the US government. The 1990s gave us something else that's relevant to today's encryption debate, which is uh, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act of 1994, or CALEA for short, which was passed because even back then, Law enforcement was concerned about the going dark problem, having their capabilities to investigate go dark due to the advent of digital telephony and the internet. So CLIA mandates wiretap ability for certain regulated entities, basically telecommunications providers, as well as whoever the FCC decides is now uh, providing essentially a substantial replacement for traditional local phone service. And that now includes two-way interconnected VoIP as well as broadband internet. There's some important limitations on CLIA. For one thing, um, even covered entities, the government cannot dictate how they comply with this mandate uh, of making their networks wiretappable. You have to comply with the goal. The government cannot tell them how. In addition, there are a couple of very important compromises that are part of the final statute. Um, one is what we'll call the information services carve out. CLIA does not apply at all to so-called information services. Um, which means email, chat apps, social media, websites, all of those are free to design encryption however they want. They do not have to comply with this wiretap ability mandate. And the other is what we'll call the encryption carve out, which says that even entities that are covered by CALEA, so telco carriers primarily, are free to encrypt communications and throw away the keys to decrypt. They only have to decrypt if they both provided the encryption themselves and they possess the information necessary to decrypt. They don't have to keep that information. And that was a compromise that was reached because civil libertarians and security experts showed up and pushed for these limitations uh, during negotiations over the bill language. 
So the bottom line is that CALEA does not require Apple or Facebook or Signal or whoever to build in an exceptional access as demanded uh, by members of US government, and the government cannot restrain the innovation of secure technologies under CALEA. If CALEA had required those things back in 1994, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now it's 2020, and encryption is in ubiquitous use by consumers because it's built in by default to popular devices and applications, which is exactly what United States law allows, despite the fact that you'll hear our attorney general and even members of the Senate who should know better, who should know what CLIA says, talking about how Apple and Facebook are creating lawless spaces and acting above the law. They're not above the law, they're doing exactly what the law allows them to do. Although not for lack of trying on the part of federal law enforcement agencies, they've been trying to roll back those compromises in CALEA that I talked about pretty much ever since it was passed. Uh, the reason that, in, that two way interconnected VoIP and broadband internet are now part of CALEA's mandate are because federal law enforcement agencies pushed for them uh, to be made part of it uh, by the FCC, which passed a rule in 2005, uh, expanding CLIA's coverage to include them. Even though they sound like they should count as information services, the FCC basically said, well, to the extent that they act like telcos, they're covered. And federal agencies have pushed for even more extreme plans multiple times since then over the last decade that would have undermined the CALEA compromise by requiring that encrypted messaging services be backdoored, have a way to decrypt all encrypted messages, and get fined if they didn't cooperate. Those proposals have failed, but the takeaway from those, if you ask me, is that law enforcement has a long track record of disregarding the compromises that they supposedly agreed to when it comes to encryption and surveillance. So when you hear law enforcement officials say the word compromise in the encryption debate, you should probably be kind of skeptical of that. So that's CALEA. What about encrypted devices? CALEA is about telco carriers. Devices are not subject uh, to, to CALEA. There's no express law compelling a company to decrypt data that it doesn't hold that's stored on any user's device. It used to be that the Department of Justice and the FBI would try using a combination of search warrants uh, plus orders under a 1789 statute called the All Writs Act to try and compel uh, companies, device makers, uh, to unlock devices for law enforcement. And up until late 2015, courts were signing these orders and Google and Apple were going along with it, and there hadn't really been a lot of analysis about whether this was actually what the law required. We finally saw an opinion come out at the end of February of 2016 from a federal magistrate judge in Brooklyn that's the lesser known Apple versus FBI case, which said that um, CALEA is a comprehensive statutory scheme around who has to uh, provide uh, uh, access to <coughs> law enforcement. It does not cover <coughs> Apple. Apple is not part of that scheme, uh, and you can't use the All Writs Act uh, to trump CALEA. The government appealed, but they dropped the case because the defendant magically remembered the passcode to his phone. Good timing. Um, that opinion came out less than two weeks after the original order in the better known San Bernardino Apple versus FBI case. Originally there was an order that would have required Apple to build a custom version of iOS that would roll back several of the security protections, not about encryption itself, but other security protections uh, built into iOS. Um, to install that on the San Bernardino shooter's iPhone. But remember, CLIA prohibits the US government from telling even covered entities to adopt any specific design for complying with the law. So even if Apple had been subject to CLIA, which they were not um, in this context, requiring Apple to create and implement a workaround for iPhone security is exactly what CLIA was intended to prohibit. So two weeks after that, when the judge in Brooklyn came out with this opinion, he was signaling very clearly in the direction of the San Bernardino court saying, you know, here's what CLIA does and doesn't do. Here's how he thinks that the court should come out on that. But we didn't get a decision on the merits, ultimately, in the San Bernardino case, because um, on literally the eve of the court hearing uh, that was supposed to happen to think about the merits of, of these legal arguments, uh, the government announced that they had bought an exploit from an unknown third party for what turned out to be around 900,000 taxpayer dollars uh, to get into that phone. And so against this backdrop, uh, Apple's continued to re-engineer their devices to make it more difficult to decrypt data. Same for Google for Android phones. Will we see a rematch over the Pensacola Naval Base shooter's iPhone? Unclear, stay tuned. So that's encrypted devices. What about encrypted messaging? Well, as said, chat apps count as in information services under CALEA, so they don't need to follow CALEA the way that telco carriers do. The DOJ learned a lesson from doing the San Bernardino case in public and open court, and that was if they're gonna do these going dark type cases to try and compel companies to change their encryption for law enforcement access purposes, they should do that uh, under seal and do this only in sealed cases. So when they, uh, from what we know from reports leaked 
uh, information leaked to Reuters reporters in 2018, uh, the government tried to compel Facebook in 2018 in a case in federal court out in Fresno to change the encryption uh, for messenger voice calls, which can be end-to-end -end encrypted. I don't think the end-to-end -end is turned on by default. Um, tried to <coughs> make them change the encryption in Messenger. We don't know exactly what they were asking to do. We don't know what exactly happened. Allegedly, the court denied that motion by the government, but we don't know what the government's legal argument was. We don't know what laws they invoked. We don't know what the court's reasoning was. Um, we can just infer that Facebook prevailed in that case, not only because of the leaks to the press, but also because Facebook has now announced plans to roll out end-to-end -end encryption across all of its messaging services, the way that WhatsApp currently is already by default. So in summary, these cases suggest that under current US law, encrypted smartphone and end-to-end -end encrypted messaging providers can't be forced to change their encryption to allow law enforcement access. Those were all just low-level federal court orders. None of this has been tested in courts of appeals, much less the Supreme Court. But that's the state of the law as it currently stands in the United States. So if that's the law as it is, <coughs> it is possible for Congress to pass another law to change that. We might see that happen, or at least some efforts to make that happen in 2020, um, especially under, so there's some reports about a new bill that may be coming out, uh, sponsored by Senators Lindsey Graham and Richard Blumenthal, um, that would curtail Section 230 immunity for child sex abuse material, or CSAM, uh, on services uh, on online platforms. That's the law that says that online platforms can't be held liable for what their users say and do on the service. <laughs> this bill would change that part of Section 230. It wouldn't cover smartphones, but the way it's drafted it would include messaging apps, email, cloud storage, et cetera. So all of the information services that CALEA currently says are free to design their encryption however they want. On its face, this bill is not about encryption. It's about establishing a commission that would come up with a set of guidelines or best practices for companies to adhere to as a safe harbor in order to keep their 230 immunity. But Encryption is really the elephant in the room for this bill. It's easy to foresee that those guidelines would condemn encryption designs that don't have an access mechanism for law enforcement built in. So it's a message to Facebook and to Signal and so forth to give law enforcement a way to see the content of supposedly end-to-end -end encrypted chats or be prepared to potentially pay through the nose through legal liability, legal exposure for doing exactly what the law allows them to do. So that's a different approach from previous attempts um, on behalf of the FBI, FBI and DOJ. It's building on a successful passage of the SESTA-FOSTA law, which also uh, nibbled away at Section 230 immunity. And that's what the sort of the current zeitgeist against big tech and against Section 230 has arguably gotten us, because nothing says sticking it to big tech and standing up for the little guy, like penalizing companies for providing good privacy and data security <laughs> for their users. That's it from me. You can at me if you want to, and I'll let it be handed over to Matt, I think. Okay. Um, I'll just stay here. So I'll just stay here. So uh, yeah. I don't have any slides up there. So um, I'm Matt Blaze. I was introduced as uh, um, as the whole panel is as a veteran of uh, two crypto wars: um, Crypto War One, which was the 1990s, and Crypto War Two, which we're still in the middle. During Crypto War One, we didn't know that it was going to be necessary to number the crypto wars, um, <laughs> but um, it, it turned out. Well, what, what's the difference between uh, the crypto wars? Is this one endless war? Well, I think if we had to, to come up with a dividing line, in Crypto War One in the 1990s, um, the advocates of uh, crypto uh, cryptography and security were um, essentially visionaries, or had to be a little bit visionary, and had to have some faith that computers and the internet and uh, electronic communication and the security of those things was going to be important any day now. Um, and we, you know, we didn't really even completely believe it ourselves. Certainly nobody would have predicted um, what uh, the 21st century uh, would have looked like back in 1990 uh, or so. And encryption, to the extent that it was used, was a pretty specialized thing. It was mostly in the realm of um, military government communications. It was used by industry. To some extent, the dominant cipher algorithm was the uh, data encryption standard with a 56-bit key. Um, which was you know, really on the margins even then of what was vulnerable to exhaustive search. Um, and most importantly, it was regulated 
essentially as a munition uh, under the arms control uh, um, uh, anti-proliferation legal regime. And what that meant was that it was perfectly legal to do all the encryption you wanted within the United States, but if you wanted to export a product, including software, that used encryption, you'd need a, a license, the same type of license you'd need to export military weapons uh, um, uh, to um, you know, a potential adversary. And essentially, they wouldn't give you this license if the encryption worked. So you could get a, you could easily get this license with, you know, with encryption with a 40-bit key, trivial to exhaustively search. Um, but beyond that, it was it was pretty hard. Um, and so the advocates of encryption had to sort of make two cases. The first is, hey, this is going to be important uh, someday, which industry even didn't really believe uh, until pretty late in the decade. And secondly, we need to change this law to allow for interoperable standards that really provide strong encryption in any kind of software that we're going to use, including open source software, which is sort of inherently exported as soon as you put it out um, on the internet. Um, so the government came up with what must have looked like a beautiful solution um, that would, would, would that, that you, you could almost hear them congratulating themselves on, on how clever this was. Um, in uh, 1991 and 1992, they designed something that's popularly uh, known as the Clipper Chip. It was officially called the escrowed encryption standard. And the idea was that this was a cipher uh, embedded in hardware that vendors of encryption products could uh, embed in their, um, in their products that would provide an 80-bit key, so much stronger than the data encryption standard, probably good enough to resist exhaustive search into, you know, well into the 21st century, um, but with a little bit of a catch, which is that, oh, by the way, a copy of the key gets sent to the government and they can decrypt it if they want. Um, this was controversial um, among uh, pe the people who cared about encryption. And so during the 1990s, we basically were emboldened by the uh, clipper chip uh, and uh, trying to fight to get the export laws um, uh, changed. Crypto War II started after we won Crypto War I. Clipper chip died. Um, the export laws were essentially effectively rolled back so that strong encryption in consumer products is, is, is legal and can be exported, um, uh, you know, for all practical purposes uh, freely. Um, and, you know, we very happily won. Tellingly, even after September 11th, when the government could have had anything they wanted, um, in, the encryption liberalization didn't get rolled back. Um, Shortly uh, thereafter, the FBI started to become the only organization on Earth complaining that computer security is too good uh, <laughs> and um, has been um, lobbying for a rollback to restricted encryption, um, not in the form of export laws, but in the form of some kind of mandate, whether by law or de facto, uh, to allow for some sort of key escrow or equivalent mechanism um, uh, in uh, products that we use. So an interesting distinction between Crypto War I and Crypto War II is that in Crypto War I, we, the people who cared about strong encryption and security and privacy, were the ones asking for a change. In Crypto War II, we're trying to fight for the status quo. And I think that's, you know, uh, gives us a, you know, very different dynamic in the way this is um, um, playing out. We are in a position of strength uh, at the moment, although, you know, that could, that could change uh, in that no news is good news on this. So what I want to do is, is make the case very briefly for why the status quo is the only tenable, um, the only tenable uh, uh, approach, why allowing unrestricted encryption and uh, is, is, is really all we can do. The first is, I think everybody here believes this is really important. Computer security uh, is not, in fact, too good uh, in 2020. 
uh, that it's actually kind of a mess and encryption is one of the very few tools we have that works. Uh, and so the ability, taking away one of these tools or making one of these tools more complicated or more expensive would be a disaster for uh, internet security and for the security of the entire connected world, uh, commerce, personal privacy, and everything else. I don't think that's a, a difficult case to make here. The second is that any kind of key escrow mechanism is going to be designed from the same kind of position of ignorance of what the future of electronic communications looks like that Clipper was designed with in the early 1990s. So I'd like to, to go back to 1992 when Clipper was designed, 1993 when Clipper was released to the public, and look at what some of the very reasonable engineering design constraints uh, that, uh, that that system was built under. Uh, the first was that uh, in, uh, most encryption would be done in hardware and that adding $20 to the price of a uh, device like a phone in order to be able to make it secure would be something completely reasonable to do. Uh, the second uh, is, so that essentially eliminates software encryption um, for anything and certainly interoperable software encryption right off the bat. Uh, the world very quickly changed to a much more software oriented world where adding uh, hardware as a requirement to do any encryption would be a ludicrous thing to uh, require. But back in the early 1990s, that wasn't nearly as clear. Second is, what's the killer app for this? Well, the killer app was voice communication on landline phones. That's how most communication in real time happened uh, in the early 1990s. I worked for a large company called the Telephone Company <laughs> that had that as their business model. They're not here anymore. The, uh, uh, the, uh, to the extent that people had mobile phones, they were big, clunky analog devices, and basically only rich business people had them. Um, the idea of a smartphone, the idea that a phone and a computer are the same thing and that they would fit in your pocket like this, was a ridiculous fantasy uh, in 1992. The, um, uh, another killer app uh, for communication was email. There was a real big concern that absent uh, any regulations, email encryption would proliferate and email would become unmonitorable. Uh, so far, we have not been as good at this as the FBI predicted uh, we would be. The, uh, um, another killer application was fax. Uh, that was sort of like the web, but with telephones and printers. Um, and uh, every business had a fax machine. The web did not exist. Uh, the internet was largely something that uh, nerds had available to them at work. It was not clear that it would ever catch on. Within 10 years, every one of these underlying assumptions that Clipper was designed <coughs> under proved to be you know, turned on its head and laughably false. Now let's imagine anything we do today, let's assume that the government wins crypto war too, and as some sort of design mandate based on engineering decisions that are perfectly valid right now, um, become the standard for encryption. Um, we are going to be looking back at those engineering decisions 10 years from now as being equally laughably wrong to all of those things that uh, we thought about uh, with Clipper um, once the 21st century uh, uh, rolled around. Uh, we will, I don't know which things are going to be wrong or how they're going to be wrong, but I can certainly imagine being in a room 10 years from now and I'll be able to say, hey, remember when we all had phones? Um, you know, and uh, you know, everyone will you know, look around and the old people will sort of chuckle. The young people won't have any idea what we're, uh, what we're talking about. It'll be like pay phones today. The, uh, you know, uh, is real-time communication the normal way we communicate or will it be store and forward? What's the relationship between storage and communication. That's been flip-flopping several times. Which one, uh, you know, does it make sense to, to store data in the cloud or locally? The correct answer to that question depends on the exact year you ask it. 
Um, and all of, those, all of those kinds of decisions are going to be either explicit or more dangerously implicit in any engineering mandates we design or are imposed on us uh, for encryption going forward. So I would argue that just as Clipper's success would have been a disaster, not just for the reasons we thought they would be a disaster in 1993, that the key escrow mechanism would get misused, but uh, they will be a disaster because they will completely hobble and constrain our ability to evolve from the engineering of the internet and computers as they exist uh, right now. So I think that the only tenable approach is the status quo. That's just the most Gen X thing ever. You've spent the 90s like fighting against the man and now you just want to maintain the status yeah, quo. Conservative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can just say, okay, boomer, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I don't think that Clipper was controversial at all. We were all against it. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, everyone. Um, oh, I guess I need a microphone. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, uh, I just love that I get to play against Matt Blaze as the conservative. Um, because I, I, I actually do um, have, I think, a somewhat different view than, than Maddish sketched out and all. Wait, I'll, you didn't say that when we were rehearsing. <laughs> <laughs> I said I might have a quibble. Uh. <laughs> it's a quibble. Um, so um, I just want to say one thing about um, the kind of posture I'm going to take up here. I've spent a lot of time on this issue, as Matt has and as Rihanna has, as an advocate on this issue, as a policymaker on this issue. Um, and I do have pretty strong advocacy views, but I'm actually not going to make them here. Um, uh, what I want to look at instead is kind of the trajectory of this policy debate, and in particular, the kinds of questions that I think the technical community is going to be called upon to engage in, because um, I think they're going to be different. Um, Rihanna did a fantastic um, overview of the kind of legal and, and policy history, um, which is, and I'm, I'm repeating it here, um, not to talk about the details, which she did talk about, but to point out the trajectory, which I think we all kind of have as an innate assumption. The trajectory is that the technical side of this debate, the people in this room, not to caricature all of you, have won, as Matt said it, that, that, that we won, crypto war won. Um, and while I think there's a, 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 a lot of ways that's true, I think that there, I think the policy world has, for example, come to accept the idea that there is real risk associated with any kind of exceptional access system, um, and also the view that Matt suggested that um, messing with security generally has real risks. I think that that has been internalized into the policy discussion around the world, which is good, uh, because it's true. <laughs> um, um, but I think while that trajectory was happening, uh, and I will say that's, been, that's happened essentially exclusively in the U.S., or at least driven by U.S. politics and the influence of U.S. tech policy around the world, there are a bunch of other things that have been happening, uh, not in the U.S., and I want to pay attention to those, urge you to pay attention to them, because I think they uh, point to the shape of the debate that we're going to have going forward. Um, Back in 2010, at the same time uh, that in the United States we were having a debate in uh, the Obama administration about whether to amend CALEA to change some of the encryption rules, um, India just declared that if BlackBerry wanted to do, if RIM wanted to do business in India, it would have to provide all of its services through what was then called the, I think it was the BlackBerry Enterprise Server, um, that would um, in some ways kind of meet the CALEA conditions that Rihanna described, uh, uh, in which uh, BlackBerry, as the service provider, would be able to decrypt any communication uh, on demand from the Indian government. So that's the way that hundreds of millions of people used encryption in India uh, as early as 2010. In 2016, uh, the UK um, uh, passed uh, the, so the last in a series of surveillance laws um, that updated the UK 
uh, surveillance legal environment. It was called pejoratively by a number of privacy advocates there, the Snoopers Charter. Um, um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it did. But it, for the purposes of our debate, it granted authority to the UK government in 2016 to compel uh, technical assistance um, uh, for law enforcement uh, by uh, communication service providers to do exactly what, as Rihanna said, under US law, communication service providers were not required to do. Um, in 2018, very much following the lead of the UK, um, Australia passed uh, a law that's been known as the Assistance and Access Bill, and it does more or less the same thing. It says that anyone providing, a, a broadly speaking, a communication service in Australia can be required in secret um, to assist law enforcement by providing <coughs> a, a plain text of any encrypted communication. And today, um, like right now, um, uh, India is actually debating uh, another set of changes to uh, their um, communications law, which would actually do something similar to what Lindsey Graham is proposing, um, uh, would link um, requirement to be able to filter and detect illegal uh, content on platforms in exchange for the liability limitations that they have that are the equivalent of the US Section 230 liability limitations. That's a debate that's happening right now. So while on the one hand, we can say that in the world that we all pay most attention to, uh, um, United States internet policy, we've won and, and perhaps are even on a still positive trajectory uh, for this debate in the US. The rest of the world is going in very, very different directions. And I want to just take a, a slightly more careful look at what the UK and Australia have done in, in their two laws. Um, the UK law specifically provides that um, so-called technical capacity notices uh, can be uh, issued against any service provider, uh, either in the UK or anyone who's providing any kind of service um, uh, from outside the UK. Um, interestingly, there are some constraints on these technical capacity notices, that is, th these requirements that the government could impose uh, to decrypt communication, to redesign their systems in whatever way that law enforcement decides is, is important. Number one, those technical capacities that can be mandated have to be technically reasonable. Um, now, that's a very broad term. <laughs> um, and the UK law actually has a pretty elaborate process and a, a sort of a bureaucratic process which I don't say pejoratively, a, 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 I think a careful process for trying to evaluate uh, whether a particular technical requirement is reasonable uh, or not. There's a commission that's set up. The commission has a technical advisory board. Um, but notably, uh, so, so, so I think it's fair to say, on the one hand, the UK law is not just toying around with this. And in fact, in the UK, those of you who know the, the system there, there's a much tighter integration between law enforcement, intelligence, and domestic cybersecurity capabilities. Um, and that is a lot of the same people who are responsible for electronic surveillance capabilities are also responsible for do the domestic cybersecurity posture generally. So they actually do have an incentive, and, and I think that actually the technical capacity to try to take into account these delicate balances of the sort that Matt uh, described. But nonetheless, the UK gave itself, the UK government gave itself, voted itself, uh, the authority uh, to impose uh, exceptional access requirements, among others, um, on service providers. What's striking partly about what the UK has done, though, I do think it's been a, it's a, a kind of a careful structure. It's also a structure that by default is in secret. And, and, I, and, and I think we'll probably all talk a little bit more about that. So we don't actually know whether these authorities have been exercised or not. We do know that some service providers has, have, ha, have what are now called technical capacity canaries, uh, not unlike warrant canaries mechanisms to try to indirectly signal to the world if a service provider has been ordered to um, uh, make changes to their security services. We, but we don't know that any of those have been triggered. Australia went a little further than this, um, uh, though in the same kind of structure. They do have these uh, mechanism for 
issuing requirements to service providers. So any of you who work for companies could be the subject of one of these requirements. Um, though, as in uh, the UK, you sitting here might not even know about it uh, because there are very strict secrecy requirements in Australia actually uh, made it a crime to disclose uh, the existence of these technical capacity notices. What's interesting about the Australia law, law is that the lawmakers there, in a, a pretty, um, pretty lively debate, actually recognized the risk of introducing systemic vulnerabilities into the communications infrastructure as a result of these exceptional access requirements. And the law says that the TCNs cannot introduce systemic vulnerabilities. But you now have to ask the question, how would you know? How would anyone know? Um, uh, the Australian government's a perfectly capable government um, and actually has very good uh, uh, kind of computer security people in the intelligence services. Um, they might know or they might not, but they might not want to say or they may not be able to say, but there isn't any kind of a transparent process. Um, some of us uh, wrote a letter and testified as, part, I think Rihanna testified, a uh, number of us testified in the Australia legislative process and pointed out in particular that some of the transparency, so some of the anti-transparency requirements in the Australian law actually run, run headlong into some of the really important new security innovations, such as certificate uh, transparency, message key transparency, and binary transparency, that the security community, the internet security community, is really coming to depend upon. Uh, so specifically, if, um, if one of these law enforcement notices from Australia um, requires, uh, for example, a change in a TLS key uh, so that, so that uh, TLS traffic uh, could be uh, surreptitiously decrypted, or a change in, in the keys for messaging services, or a change in software that users have on their own devices, uh, the service providers would be put in a very awkward position of having to either somehow try to squeeze that through these new technical transparency mechanisms that are being implemented um, or not, and then risk criminal fines. So there's a real interesting collision that's happening technically. But I want to focus your attention also on what I think has happened and what these two laws signal for the direction of the policy debate. These laws reflect a decision to do what's a kind of a very common and sometimes sensible legislative tactic, which is the legislature was faced with this hard question. Should we require exceptional access or not? And you have the Matt Blazes of the world saying, don't do it for all kinds of technical reasons. You have the Bill Bars of the world saying, we must, we must, we must. And um, the what the legislatures here, what the, le the legislators here is a complicated problem that they don't know how to resolve. No hearings, no, no number of congressional hearings is actually going to get to the bottom of this question, nor do they necessarily want to have to make a hard call uh, on the question. So what do they do? They punt it to a process. And I don't say punt pejoratively. We make a lot of policy this way by saying, well, there's a hard technical question. Let's defer that to experts. Um, that's what the UK has done. That's what Australia has done. Um, but they've done it in secret or with secrecy around it. So that's going to pose a real challenge. But I would suggest to you that this shift in the debate is, is somewhat permanent. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an attractive and in some ways elegant answer to a hard policy problem. And so I want to look with you at what this new expert debate uh, is going to look like. Um, uh, in the last year, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which is a really distinguished um, uh, policy think tank uh, got together a bunch of experts from different sides of this spectrum, including former White House chiefs of staff and general counsels of the FBI and um, technical experts, um, and tried to look at what to do. And they didn't exactly come to any hard and fast conclusions, but they did say, well, maybe there are some areas, some technical solution areas that we should look at. And in particular, um, uh, as highlighted by a recent uh, op-ed from Susan Landau, who's a co-author of, of Matt and mine um, on, on keys under doormats, and Dennis McDonough, who was the uh, White House uh, Chief of Staff under President Obama, 
they said, well, why don't we try looking harder at device encryption? Because maybe that's a little easier to solve than communications uh, uh, encryption. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, experts in the UK, when they've spoken publicly about this, come to the exact opposite conclusion. Ian Levy, who the, was the technical director at GCHQ and is now the technical director of the UK Cybersecurity um, Center, uh, said, oh, device encryption is really hard. We shouldn't touch that. Let's just, let's just focus on, on messaging security. Um, so it shows that um, moving the debate to experts, on the one hand, gets you down to details in a, sort, in a way that we haven't exactly, but is not necessarily easy. Um, I want to end just by highlighting some questions that I think are going to have to be answered one way or the other in this new policy debate uh, that we, I don't think, really, really know how to answer very well. Um, broadly speaking, from the technical perspective, just what, what is the right way to measure technical feasibility of any particular technical capacity notice that might be ordered by the, US, by the uh, UK government uh, or the Australian government? And in particular, how do we know when a vulnerability is systemic? What does that mean? How can we detect it? Um, uh, and more broadly, um, are we able to kind of assess the relative security costs of um, an exceptional access system as against the security costs that, as, as all of you know, are often accepted in the design of systems for the sake of convenience or cost or, or, or whatever else? Um, as the, as the policy debate moves from the legislatures, who I think have basically just gotten frustrated with this and have decided they can't really make a lot of progress, into these regulatory processes, which may unfortunately be at least partially opaque, um, we're going to have to have good technical mechanisms for answering this. It's not unlike you know, mechanisms that we have for measuring um, the impact of uh, uh, of, of climate change um, on seawater rise. Uh, we have measures for that kind of thing. We don't have a lot of good measures in this space. And then, of course, there are a number of significant policy issues broadly, um, I think most of which are actually going to have to do with whether we can really seriously think of doing this in secret. Final thing I'll say about this, about the question of secrecy, is that in many ways, we got to the, at least in the US, we got to Crypto Wars 2 because of the Snowden disclosures. We got to Crypto Wars 2 because right after the Snowden disclosures, um, uh, Apple and then, and then Android said that they were moving to end-to-end -to -end encryption because very, very, they very bluntly said they considered the NSA to be an adversary um, and they needed to up the ante on their security designs um, in order to, to meet the, the strength of an adversary like the NSA. That's what got us um, device encryption by default in both of the smartphone ecosystems. It's what got us the, the impetus for uh, HTTPS everywhere. Um, probably a lot of you were really happy about it because it probably got people uh, in your companies or your organizations to pay attention to what your security priorities much more than they did before Snowden. Um, but the immediate result of that was that law enforcement saw that the smartphones that they were used to being able to relatively easy, easily get access to all of a sudden became a lot harder to get access to. Um, uh, so um, I think that there's nothing about this issue that's going away, but I think the questions that we're going to have to ask, ask and be able to answer with technical authority are going to become much more specific. The kinds of arguments that we were able to make in 97 in the risk of key recovery paper um, based on, on Matt's findings and other technical findings, kinds of arguments we made in Keys Under Doormats 2015 were very high-level arguments, very high-level uh, claims of risk which I still think are true, but I think we're going to have to get much more into details with specific proposals and specific systems to try to understand um, how to make kind of coherent technology policy arguments about what kinds of risks should and should not be accepted. So I'll leave it at that. Look forward to questions.
All right, thank you very much. It's great to be here. And when I started off in this world, in the very start of Crypto War One, I was doing what was then called social virtual reality, which fragmented into communications and collaboration systems and social networks into different directions. And lots of people told me at the time that they did not want to do collaboration, et cetera, on the then pretty new public internet without having some sort of encryption in place because then anybody could see them come up with whatever ideas that they had. There was no SSL, and so I sat down and I started coding up my own things, and it snowballed from there. And when I joined the ACLU, one of the things that they asked was, oh, what do you want to work on? And I said, oh, not encryption backdoors. I've been doing that for over 20 years. It, the arguments have not changed. It's really boring. How about the threat of artificial intelligence and machine learning and how those are unreliable, dot, dot, dot? And, well, the world has found me. I have had come back in my head many times wise advice that Gandalf gives about how the times choose you and your measure as a person is how you stand up to the times choosing you. So... I'm going to start here and say, thinking about things that are not directly encryption, but the threats that we have on it, and a world that has encryption in here, it is a basic human right for two people to talk confidential, confidentially, no matter where they are. This is, this, is, this is something that's sacrosanct. We as human beings need to talk to each other, and as we go into a more internet world, that expectation just to be able to whisper in someone else's ear is part of what makes us human. And so, um, nothing goes past here. I am starting with the idea that we have end-to-end -end encryption anyway. Also, to start off with, Public posts are important. I mean, you know, integrity and availability, which are the other two-thirds of these, the confidentiality, integrity, availability model, are, are important. And yes, availability is kind of the whole point. See what happens when your favorite service goes down. And there's this huge gray area between something that is private and something that is public. Three people talking looks a lot more like two, despite the fact that I mentioned the Ben Franklin principle, which I've used, which is three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead, um, to a truly public post, which you, 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 know, you ought to be able to do a certain amount of, of checking on it, but there's this huge gray area in the middle to know when it is, on the one hand, you're utterly private. On the other hand, everybody sees what you do. And as that slides into the middle, there ought to be some technology that does something in the middle. And this is not an easy problem. I'm just mentioning that. Now, today's crypto wars are, in fact, driven by a need to solve real problems, which is a euphemism for saying they found the fourth horse being. We used to talk about the four horse being of the infocalypse, and they were um, money laundering, um, um, terrorism, kitty porn, and I forget what the fourth one was. But they moved, they moved to child abuse as the thing that they're using as the reason why they have to have the back doors. But that doesn't mean that it's not a real problem. And this is also the point at my, in my talk where I feel like I need to do an aside kind of like this were an episode of Fleabag or something. It really bugs me about this crypto war that I have to do things like say, I'm against child abuse. I'm against genocide. I'm, I don't like the fact that I should have to say this in such a way that it sh should sound like a surprise and that you all should find it a surprise and perhaps be undecided on this issue. Okay, I'm done. Back to it. These are real problems. We have child abuse, intimate partner abuse, elder abuse, that's up and coming. Generation X is gonna start retiring inside a decade. Millennials are what we used to call 30-somethings. So, so as you end up 
with with your crazy relative <coughs> who does the stereotypical crazy relative things, it's going to be us and young people and they're going to know how to use computers and that isn't going to change things in some dramatic ways. We're also seeing attacks on accepted norms and the validity of governance at all. And that's the pretext and they're worth solving. Now the way that we should solve these is in fact to get community managers, user experience people along in with us and in many cases have them take the lead. I used to be them, I'm not one anymore. I say that intentionally because while we've been really good at convincing crypt people not to roll their own crypto, we're really bad at convincing cryptographers not to roll their own UX. <laughs> and they're really bad at it. And it drives me up the wall. Okay, so we need some new design principles. We did privacy and security by design. I wrote up some, some uh, design principles for a couple of workshops that Rihanna and I were in. We want to have tools for, for mitigating abuse for the platforms, the people themselves, and the caregivers. And this is also going to be an interesting problem because in many of the most pernicious types of abuse, the caregivers are the first suspect in who the perp is. So you can't assume they're good. And a lot of what we're dealing with now is the assumption that you're talking to somebody because you want to talk to them and it's going to be a pleasant conversation as opposed to some picture that was sent out of the blue. So we want to rethink how we did things. When we did the internet, we did things because people were awful in various ways that included control over who had the microphone, control over how information was distributed, and the whole point was in many cases to flatten the world. Now we have people being awful to each other in new way because the equivalent of shouting at your television is you type really hard when you do a tweet. So we need to both enable and constrain people. And some of the mitigations that we can talk about to throw a few out include how do we handle unsolicited combat contact? We are about to be in a world in which you can't just make a phone call to another number. That is an optional feature, is already shipping in smartphone operating systems. That's the way the world's going. So you're going to have to have some sort of introduction, be that leave a voicemail or what, before you can phone somebody. That, that ought to extend to a lot of other places. There ought to be easier reporting of abuse, easier blocking people, so on and so forth. But again, the assumption that this might not be the thing that you really wanted to be doing. Voluntary machine learning advice on content, fact checkers. Wouldn't it be great if somebody sent me something and I could say, what does Snopes say? Data provenance, who sent it? Limitations on forwards, limitations on group size. A lot of these are already being done. These are the sorts of things that all can be helpful. Social graph analytics, which groups are talking to which other groups? Who's talking among themselves? better handling of profiles that aren't particularly legitimate without going so far as to say, I have to have the real person. It's, it's, there are ways to do this, it's just, it's just hard. We wanna rethink things like UX friction. Maybe it ought to be that it takes a couple extra taps to forward a certain type of thing that'll slow people down. We need to have UX focus on the experience, not engagement. Um, context dependent, dependent behavior based on personal status. I mean, for example, if you are a child, you might have a slightly different experience. If you are using something like screen time to monitor your relatives, you get a roll up of who they've been talking to and all. All of these things can help. We're already seeing the beginnings of that. On, on my watch here, it behaves slightly differently depending upon whether or not you are above 65 or below 65, but it's a default. You can change it. So you can have extra heart monitoring if you're, if you're young. You can turn off the heart monitoring if it's just going to, to irritate you. So those sorts of changing the way that things go are all going to help a little, and I think that while I threw a bunch of spaghetti against the wall, 
that was merely to get the conversation started. There are better people than me to think of these things, but that is a place that we should go to undermine the challenge to what we have to have, which is, in fact, an end-to-end -end encrypted world. Well, some questions for each other. Anybody, want, anybody got one that, that was, was burning while we were all? Hi. Yeah, I do. This is Rick Farrow. Um, I, I, you mentioned Clipper Chip. Um, Dan Slide mentioned that Matt Blaze had something to do with that. I think that people forget the problem of having um, key escrow and backdoors and code. Could you spend at least two minutes explaining what you did with the Clipper chip? Yeah, so I, I found a narrow technical problem that made uh, Clipper easy to evade while still taking advantage of the large, uh, the Clipper key escrow features would be, uh, were easy to evade while still taking advantage of the stronger cipher, which basically meant that there was no point in this uh, in this expensive uh, thing. So that was a, a design flaw. You know, they could probably have fixed the design flaw, but it illustrated two really important things that I think we now take to heart as a given. The first is that crypto protocol design is really, really, really hard. You know, this was designed by the NSA, uh, which is really, really good at it. And they missed a re relatively simple protocol failure. And, you know, when you design a mechanism that includes key escrow, you are designing a complex cryptographic protocol that um, can uh, fail in ways that you don't anticipate. Now, this particular failure was a failure that allowed you to use the cipher more strongly, but it could have just as easily been a failure that allowed anybody to decrypt communication or to, you know, um, man in the middle communication in some way that would allow them uh, to get access to it without going through the escrow mechanism. Uh, you know, and who, for all we know, Clipper may have also had some of those failures. You know, people kind of stopped looking at it after the the first embarrassment um, uh, uh, happened. So, um, you know, I discovered the first of them, and so Clipper itself went away, but the concept of key escrow didn't. Now, in the case of key escrow, there are two big problems which we also take to heart, have taken to heart now. The first is the obvious one, which is that there now needs to be a database of keys, and that needs to be protected in some way, and if it's not really, really, really well protected, it becomes a soft target that gets you access to everyone's communication that uses a particular cipher. That's bad. Uh, the other um, uh, problem with key escrow is it's expensive and a design constraint. And you know, give essentially what uh, Clipper did was created a an. an uh, an engineering economic that made it much, much cheaper to not bother with encryption than to include it. Mm -hmm. And I think fundamentally that was the worst problem with, with Clipper, although it's not the one that killed it. Thank Can you. I just make one quick observation about the way I think the policy world has responded to that um, basic observation that it's very hard to do this? Um, the, from, from the time that Jim Comey, when he was FBI director, kind of reopened the, what the FBI calls the going dark issue, Comey said, yeah, I understand it's hard to do, and I understand government should not be designing these systems. You people in Silicon Valley figure this out. That is, you're building these systems. You figure out how to build this feature in. We're not going to tell you um, how to do it. We're just going to tell you that you have to do it. Um, so, so that kind of pushes the, uh, 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 the ball into the other court, uh, if, if you will. Um, I, I, I don't think it changes how hard the problem is. I think it, it does uh, uh, reflect in fact, it reflects a recognition of how hard the problem is. Um, but it, it is a claim that it should be solvable within 
kind of the same security parameters as a lot of other security systems are built and within the same set of trade-offs that a lot of other security systems exist in. And, and again, I think that's an argument that requires kind of getting down to details. I don't think you can really have that argument um, uh, as to a, the, the highest level abstraction of, uh, uh, of an exceptional access system. I think you probably have to look at particular cases and I think that's ultimately where where this may be heading. Yeah, let me just add one quick thing to that, which is that one thing that Kia's crew does is it creates a really bad failure mode, right? Particularly when you say, you know, let's leave it to industry. You can do all the crypto you want. Just make sure you include a back door. Um, what the failure mode is that the back door is really crappy. And it will be measured by whether it is able to serve the needs of law enforcement. One way to serve the need of law enforcement is all keys are a string of all zeros, right? Uh, that's that, and that works as a, a mechanism that will meet the needs of uh, law enforcement. Another way is to put all keys in an Excel database on the website of the, um, um, of the vendor, and just anyone can download it. Um, and those things all will work as an escrow mechanism. They just really, really seriously degrade the security. And yet, they still become successful in the eyes of the government. And that's the failure mode for a design mandate here. And I just want to follow up on something that Danny was saying, which is, you know, I usually am very hard on law enforcement, and I usually go fairly soft on industry as being the people that are, that are building these systems and have a hard time of doing this because building secure software is really hard. We're terrible at it. But I got to say, you know, everybody wants to look like a genius when they're raising Series A. But then <laughs> if you say we're the wizards and the geniuses of Silicon Valley, look at all the magical things we can do, like self-driving cars and artificial intelligence and everything else. And then law enforcement comes to you and says, all right, G, Genius, build this thing, this secure golden key that we're asking for. Don't be surprised if they looked at you kind of askance with a raised eyebrow when you're like, well, we can't do that. You know, this is kind of like, you know, to, to hold this industry accountable, like we kind of made this bed and now we're kind of lying in it. You can dismiss it as like, oh, the nerd harder argument, but like if you want to be the super nerd and you get asked to nerd harder, well, show up and do it, right? Adding one thing in here, when it came to the, the new ghost user proposal, I wrote a long set of things that are on the ACLU website, and that's the more public version. The technical version goes, goes into a lot more detail, where I did something similar to what Matt did with Clipper and specifically called it out, where I showed how you could inevitably detect the ghost, ignore it, lie to it, et cetera. So, um, and I, I definitely was reminded of the Clipper thing, that this was Clipper again, that you're going to be able to just not play the game or play a, a, a different game. But, and remember though, if you put, if you fast forward, um, you know, Matt's, vulnerability discovery or, you know, Modi Young did, set, found a, a kind of related set of vulnerabilities um, a year later, I think. Um, put that in the context of the UK law and the Australian law where the um, evaluation of those vulnerabilities is going to happen in a government process that forces a discussion of, of, of trade-offs in some way and says, okay, how bad is that? And are there mitigations? And um, uh, who could do that? And by the way, and Rihanna's been really a leader in pointing this out, um, it may also happen in secret, but whether it happens in secret or not, and I think we should all resist it happening in secret, I think there's still a lot that we can all contribute to uh, a, a kind of a richer technical analysis of exactly what these concerns are and exactly what the trade-offs are, because eventually they'll be, uh, unlike, I mean, the, the evaluation of Matt's finding was basically the New York Times. It was basically kind of popular reaction and people got all upset. And, 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 and so everyone, the government officials kind of backed off and said, okay, well, we don't want to, you know, piss anyone off. It, it sort of goes to Rihanna's invocation of the, you know, the kind of technical priesthood. I think we're going to be in a different environment where there are going to be people who are reasonably technically competent um, who are going to evaluate kind of the pros and cons of all these ideas, and we're going to have to figure out how to contribute uh, to that. Okay, next question. Uh, Eric Gross. 
Thank you all for spending your time debating law enforcement on this topic. That gives me the luxury to quietly <laughs> design and build my end-to-end -end encrypted systems, and I, I enjoy that a lot more than those debates. But I have a question for you. I regard the content encryption in the communication and storage systems I build as fait accompli, but there's still metadata, which I'm only lightly protecting. I wonder if you find in your debates with law enforcement, it would be useful to trot out the argument that today they still have metadata available to them, perhaps only under a court order, but at least it's there available. If they piss off the software designers sufficiently, <coughs> we may choose to more tightly protect even the metadata, and they would be in a worse way. I don't actually want to go there because, as John was saying, there are actual problems out in the world that I want law enforcement to help us with. But if they push me to the wall, I'm willing to do that. So I'm just wondering how you feel that changes the dynamics of the debate. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're in this golden age of metadata. We're creating much more of it than ever before. And metadata, unlike your content, doesn't lie about what you're doing. Um, you know, metadata is, uh, you know, tells you who you're communicating with, when you were communicating, where you were, and so on. And, you know, one interesting distinction between content protection and metadata protection is it's really easy to do unilateral stuff to do end-to-end -end content protection. You can encrypt content end-to-end, -end, and um, that doesn't require help from the infrastructure or only trivial help from the infrastructure. Protecting metadata is really hard to do end-to-end -end without help, extensive help from the infrastructure itself. You know, I'm on the board of Tor. Tor is one way of protecting metadata. It's really, you know, expensive. It involves, you know, if at least three times more communication than you would otherwise do. You know, it's not clear that that scales well and it works only for, you know, limited uh, applications. I don't think even if we wanted to, you know, as an industry, as a community, we're going to be able to, to do much about the proliferation of metadata because it's just a fundamentally harder thing uh, to, to protect. Um, you know, that said, um, law enforcement has not, in my experience, been terribly satisfied with the argument that says, hey, look, you've got all this metadata. Um, uh, you know, the, the answer we inevitably get is, yeah, and we want the content too. But also, yeah, I'll add that like you, if you bring up an interesting, I think, tension in the policy debate, which is that there are a number of safety valves that I think so far have prevented us from seeing aggressive legislation, at least in the United States, um, around encryption design, which is that there's kind of a status quo where some things kind of work. Okay, I can't get into uh, this particular device unless I go and buy a Celebrate for however much taxpayer money, but I can go to Apple with a warrant and get an iCloud backup from the device. Apple was in the news last week for not encrypting uh, backups from phones end to end. And that's, that's content, it's not metadata, but the availability of metadata and the availability of things like backups and cloud storage and, and so forth I think is kind of a, acts as a, as a balancing act where there's still enough available that hopefully law enforcement can still do its job and solve the very real problems that are out there. And so when we're faced with a sort of a mandate of progress of continually trying to increment and making better and better security and saying, okay, well, how do we protect metadata better? How do we protect backups better? It's coming right up against this tension of, well, that also is going to conflict with changing the state of affairs where there's still this safety valve of enough information out there uh, to at least kind of keep law enforcement at bay that I think we're going to run right up um, further and further against as we progress here. So I there, er Eric, there's a, I think an interesting tension actually in the, uh, the way that we in the privacy community approach this issue. If you look at a lot of the leading privacy debates now that that get a lot that get a lot of attention that go to the Supreme Court you have you know debates like uh, what should law enforcement have to do to get access to location metadata um, so so and and you and you could hear a lot of privacy advocates and privacy scholars saying well actually the metadata is far more revealing than the content and we should be protecting the metadata at a higher legal standard than we do the content and there's good reason for that because uh, as Matt said it doesn't lie and it's also you know, uh, susceptible to, to building much more um, comprehensive pictures of a person's activity. Um, 
I guess if I could channel law enforcement for a moment, because um, I've spent a lot of time with people in law enforcement, and I don't think their view is um, how do they get uh, a sort of a solution here that's good enough. They have the metadata today. Uh, so you're not really offering them much <laughs> by saying <laughs> they can keep it. <laughs> um, uh, they. You know, uh, for for reasons that I, I kind of respect, um, the law enforcement view of this issue generally is that they need as much capacity, as much surveillance capacity as is allowed in the U.S. under the Fourth Amendment. Um, and I'll, I will just sort of push back a little bit on John. I, I understand the importance of having a pri private conversations. But we, in fact, don't have either a human right or a right under the US Constitution to any private conversation at all. We have that right legally as constrained by law, as constrained by what courts, when courts decide government can intrude or not. And fundamentally, the way that law enforcement looks at this issue, as you know, is that there are a bunch of technical decisions that are being made uh, that, in fact, limit the legal authority that law enforcement have. They're not, they would say, they're not trying to change what the Fourth Amendment says. They think it's the technical community that's trying to change what the Fourth Amendment says. And, uh, you know, uh, th th that's, a, that's a, a sort of an abstract debate that probably doesn't go very far. I think w w what I would say practically, though, to your point is that um, I think that law enforcement could use a lot of technical assistance in understanding how to make the most of metadata and how to, for investigative purposes and how to make the most of whatever data they do have available. Um, and, and I think that's been a, it's been a persistent problem. Um, the FBI is not, or, or much less local or state police agencies is not necessarily the sexiest place to work if you're, um, if you're technically really inclined, but maybe we should try to change that. Um, because I don't, I, I think that some part of what drives these problems is just fundamental uh, technical limitations in the way that law enforcement conducts investigations. And I think if, I think if we could help with that generally, it would just take some of the pressure uh, uh, off of this issue. So, I so, so wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a couple of things. One is that I said that it was a a, a fundamental human right. I it did isn't. not say it, it was. Sa it, it, I was. It isn't. Yes, it is. No. It, uh, well, it, it is not enshrined in U.S. law. It's but that merely means law. that 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 the U.S. doesn't do that. That is not. That's not what rights are. I'm, but well, well, anyway, it, but, let's move. Let's move on. Well. So I, I want to uh, disagree, though. The, so I, there is one other thing that I want to talk about, the technical Danny's things. Danny's wrong. Let's just all agree that, on that. Good, yeah, I agree that, that. There are a ending whole bunch right now, of we're finally starting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, there are technical things that we really do need to solve. That if you live in a world that has end-to-end that has -end encryption everywhere, and even if you have, live in a world that has a lot of data, there are things that we do not manage very well. For example, one's digital assets are not managed so that you can pass them on to one's heirs. One of the things that the um, law enforcement people talk to me that they find most heartrending is, for example, somebody gets murdered or a horrible accident happens and they can't open that phone up. We really do need to have a way that, that you could say go to somebody's heirs and say, you know, what does their data say? This is a problem also worth solving, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a bunch of fundamental rights. Um, so. There are a whole bunch of places where we can nerd harder. The problem that we have is that law enforcement has a specific problem that they want to solve, and it is at the end of the day, get rid of encryption without getting rid of encryption. And that one is extraordinarily hard. Um, and. Erica Portnoy, for example, wrote an excellent article on how end-to-end -end encryption is not merely syntactic, but it's also semantic. 
and, and, and that's really important to understand that, that it isn't just bits and bytes and that continuing to talk about just bits and bytes isn't going to get us anywhere. I've also been in places with, the, with law enforcement who have said things like the Fourth Amendment is an obligation of the government to, serve, to find things no matter where they do and that if they don't find them, the judge will punish them just like if we go back to our bosses and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't do that. And every lawyer in the room found that to be novel and innovative. All right. I'm going to, we could go on probably the whole day on this conversation. <laughs> I know it's amazing. And I know there are folks waiting to ask questions. Unfortunately, we are a little bit over our schedule. Uh, we have refreshments in the back. Uh, we, let's take a 20, 25 minute break and come back. And most importantly, let's thank our very first Enigma panel. Thank you.